I am puffed up about these books that I have to tell you about today. Mm, man, I did have a good reading month. It was a good time. We have some five stars in here. We have some new favorites. I'm just gonna talk your ear off today. So make sure you get comfortable. Make sure you get some snacks. Make sure you find a cat somewhere. I don't know. I'm just gonna get into it. Like I'm just gonna jump into that book. I'm just gonna jump to that book. It is a five star for me. When I finished it, I wasn't convinced. When I sat down to write my notes for this wrap up, I was like, well, what do you know? Turns out this book is actually a five star and it is a new favorite. And it was our book pick for the World Tour Book Club, which is just my around the world, everyone's around the world reading challenge over on Fable. This book broke some people. We lost some soldiers along the way, which is completely understandable because this book is honestly extremely challenging very tricky very twisty very meta very postmodern for me it became it just became kind of everything truly a unique book like this is i haven't read a book like this you know when people say that but like this i truly mean i truly mean because this novel is just something else uh and that is of course if on a winter's night a traveler by calvino this is our pick for italy and i'm just gonna get straight into it if you've not heard of if on a winter's night a traveler um, what is it about? <laughs> mm. We have two people. They both like to read books. Our reader goes to the bookstore, picks up a book, starts reading it, gets hooked. The novel weirdly cuts off at like the moment of suspense and he finds that the book is just repeated. Like there's been a mistake in printing. In rage, he goes to the bookstore where he bought the book and he's like, yo, this isn't okay. I wanna read the rest of the book. I'm hooked, where is it? The publisher is like, oh my God, it happened to you too. It turns out that the book he was reading, which is coincidentally, If on a Winter's Night a Traveler by Italo Carvino, wasn't actually if on a winter's night a traveler it isn't actually the book that the title and the author purports it to be it was another book that had been mistakenly put inside the performance if you will of the cover right so he's like okay that's fine you know what i don't even want to read the original book that i bought i'll just read the one book that i was actually reading which is a different title different author he goes home with that book happy to continue the story and he finds out that the same thing happens again and that it's actually not the story that he was reading it's a completely different tale copy paste so we have these two readers they meet each other they're like oh haha ha, this happened to you and they're like well we're gonna go on a mission to find out what the hell is actually happening here why can't we ever finish the story why does the story keep changing on us what is really going on here like let's get to the bottom of this so if on a winter's night a traveler this thing that i'm holding in my hands this book is so hard to talk about um is made up of at least i think 10 different novels that the reader and the other reader um are trying to read this is a book about reading it's a novel about the act of reading a novel what does it mean what do you do it's a book to study what reading means and what it can mean and what it does so in that respect it's incredibly cool let me just preface this it is so frustrating, okay? The amount of you guys who are losing your minds in the discussion posts, valid. I was right there with you. If you go into this and you're frustrated, don't get discouraged because in part, that is of course Calvino's mission. If you could not drink my coffee, is to mislead you, is to trick you, is to sometimes straight up lie to you. He leads you down rabbit holes that really have no ending. To start with the basic, most simplest thing, like his writing really needs to be praised because each different novel, right? There's 10 different novels embedded in this one novel. The way that he pens them, it's, it's really impressive because you probably wouldn't be able to tell that they're by the same author. They're each so stylistically different. They're different in tone, in their writing style. It's so impressive the way that they really do just feel complete like they're novels that exist in the world and the way that Calvino just switches and can switch so seamlessly between styles, characters, worlds, what he's trying to accomplish with each. It's really, it's truly cool, right? And that's the author's job ultimately, but Calvino in here takes it to a whole nother level and you realize that this is what writers and authors are hopefully doing all of the time. They're putting on little different hats, you know, they're masters of disguise. I think at the core of the novel it's really just about how how alone you are when you read about how sometimes lonely reading can be you walk into a book by yourself you're there by yourself you're reading it by yourself you only have your own mind your own perceptions in a way you you're writing the book as much as the writer because it exists when you step into it it exists because of you this is something that i don't know i kind of want to touch upon but the way that you 
read you are creating it because every single word every single sentence every single paragraph and the novel as a whole means something different and means something so personal for you so personal in fact that it can only mean that one thing only for you it can never mean what it means to you exactly to someone else and this is what the novel gets at a lot which i'll get into in a second if we take this idea that you read a novel alone you're in it alone it's your own personal world reading is really a solitary habit if perchance a very jealous lover were to take this idea and push it to its extreme that when you are in a book something happens that they cannot account for if they were to become quite narcissistic about it the book represents for them this barrier they can't get into they can't really control you you're just kind of there alone the book for them would represent this world of interiority of aloneness and this interpretation that they cannot be a part of as much as they would like to try it would represent a threat to them but kind of plays with this idea a little bit as much as it is about the reader it's also about the writer as well it's about how the words escape escape the writer as soon as they write them they're gone they're into the world when someone else has read them they don't belong to the writer anymore they can only belong to the reader in terms of interpretation knowledge really really truly if we're pushing these ideas to like the max which Calvino does there's the text there's the book that you're reading there are the individual words but like the book says all of this is just pretext for something else that happens completely alone in yourself the conclusion I have reached is that reading is an operation without object or that its true object is itself. The book is an accessory aid or even a pretext. A lot of the novels, like for example, this is one, a lot of them feel like we aren't actually getting access to the novel word for word that Calvino is saying that our character, our protagonist is reading. A lot of the times it feels like we're getting the novel filtered through the thoughts of the reader. So at times he will describe verbatim what is happening in the text, but a lot of the times he will just describe the way the novel is written. Like the novel will write itself, the the way that it is written, if that makes any kind of sense. For example, the novel here repeats fragments of conversation that seem to have no function beyond that of depicting the daily life of a provincial city, so it will like comment on the novel itself. This book, I think because it is for the reader so much, it's going to speak to every kind of reader in such a different way. For me, <laughs> for me, it became all about the void classic and what the hell do i mean by that in if on a winter's night a traveler there is a character who runs this computation so she makes the computer um, digest a novel and spit out the most repeated words and then from this list we'll take like the 20 most repeated words in a certain book and from this list she can kind of deduce what the novel is about for me what like my brain snagged on if it was a little computer what it really kept catching was the word void and themes of the void or the abyss or nothingness he writes that reading is always this there is a thing that is there a thing made of writing a solid material object which cannot be changed which is the book okay the text it doesn't change it's just the words it's just this product it is this physical thing that has an existence that i can see and through this thing we measure ourselves against something else that is not present something else that belongs to the immaterial invisible world because it can only be thought imagined or because it was once and is no longer past lost unattainable in the land of the dead i really truly think that the book is just a reminder of the void any book any single book any piece of thing having to do with language full reminder that yes this is what every piece of writing every piece of literature is really truly covering up or hiding or trying to disguise is this void this emptiness this unproductive space where it's just you the novel exists only as suggestion the work of interpretation it also reminds that words really don't mean anything they don't mean anything they're only false signs and symbols and they are false because they don't they don't have a one-to-one -one ratio they're all metaphors for something that we can't ever really truly express to one another which is why i hate language and why i love language this is a theme that i feel like at the end of the day is the only theme it has to be the medium it's called a medium for a reason it's just this middle ground it's this something this like physical thing that he's saying words on a page but it's only acting as a medium because it is trying to connect with this other world that actually can't be expressed at all but it's trying to do its darndest you and me we have to make the word 
mean something. We have to make language mean something. We have to believe in it. We have to have faith that yes, I can actually communicate to you something, but it will never be the thing. And it's really this faith in this higher power of the word and of language that is really giving it any meaning at all. Like we are the ones giving it the power. Language does not have any power or meaning on its own at all. It's, it's nonsense. It's a lie, which this book likes to talk about a lot. It likes to talk about falseness, fakeness, apocrypha. And that's why so much of this book is so misleading. So much of it takes you around in circles where you're like, am I really supposed to be following along with this crackpot story? You've just jacked up? No, every expression, especially in language, every expression is just such a mediocre attempt to record experience. Do you want to demonstrate that the living also have a wordless language with which books cannot be written, but which can only be lived second by second, which cannot be recorded or remembered? First comes this wordless language of living bodies, then the words books are printed with, and attempts to translate that first language are vain. The reader, the protagonist in this novel, obsessively searches for the continuation of these novels that he's reading that cut off. He goes to bizarre lengths, like he needs answers. He needs answers. He does this because he is uncomfortable, and I don't blame him, but he's uncomfortable with the void he can't take it the novels that cut off the end some of them just like stop and the rest of the book the rest of the bound book are just blank pages which represent that void each of them cut off like a little train reaching the end of its track and he falls into this bottomless nothing the books that cut off are a very physical symbol of the void that is actually in every single book in every single expression in every single novel i seem to be feeling what she feels that every void continues in the void. Every gap, even a short one, opens onto another gap. Every chasm empties into the infinite abyss. The story must also work hard to keep up with us, to report a dialogue constructed on the void, speech by speech. For the story, the bridge is not finished. Beneath every word, there's nothingness. So what the hell is, is the void? What is it? What is this void that we're all so scared of? Um, I think it's me. <laughs> I'm the void. Uh, it's me, but it's also you too. We are the void. Not collectively, individually. We are both the void. We are each our own void. How exciting. You are singularly alone. It's just you. I'm sorry. Nothing that I can do can ever really truly make you understand what I'm thinking. What I'm saying really is not capturing what is up here what what is here it's not doing an adequate job like literally whatsoever as hard as i try i can never really truly make you feel what i'm feeling make you understand what i understand of my life make you aware of my experience in a way that is anything other than an approximate and if you ever were by some miracle to understand exactly as i understand i would have no knowledge of this i can make you read 10 different little mini novels, each at the heart of them, which are trying to kind of express the same human emotion and experience, which I'm not gonna spoil for you because you have to read it yourself. Every single reader who reads them, every single one of you in the book club, you probably had one that connected with you the most, the one whose characters, whose language, whose style, whose colors, whose setting, like communicated to you really the truth hidden at the core of each of the 10 novels the most succinctly, the most fully as it possibly can. It talks about language as all the poor alphabets by which one human being believes at certain moments that he is reading another human being, but he's not. What? What the hell are we supposed to do with that? Is the book fake? Is narrative a lie? Is nothing meaningful? Is nothing real? Can nothing really truly ever be expressed? I don't know. These are questions that this book slaps you in the face with and they're like, well, do you have an answer? And no. No, I don't. The other reader, um, who's really our other protagonist, um, she kind of gets at it quite well. For this woman, reading means stripping herself of every purpose, every foregone conclusion. To be ready to catch a voice that makes itself heard when you least expect it. A voice that comes from an unknown source, from somewhere beyond the book, beyond the author, beyond the conventions of writing, from the unsaid from what the world has not yet said of itself and does not yet have the words to say. And that, I don't know, that is just the mission. That is the mission goal <laughs> of reading, um, is to open yourself up as much as you possibly can to something that is not 
your void to open yourself onto the the other void that exists in in everyone else in conclusion i've yapped about this long enough notebook stands alone i think novels unlike you and me who are kind of stuck in um putting our faith into this language like the novels all they have is the language and because every single um book is written in language that's how books have to be written obviously hello they can communicate with each other they can communicate back and forth with each other so much more effectively than you and i ever could and this is what intertextuality is all about that's why it's so important and and can create so much meaning through this web of connections and that's a lot about what this book is about that's why this book is made up of so many different books because books aren't ever alone and it gets at the relationship between readers so well and really just between people because we use the book as a proxy for each other and that's just why i love reading you guys that's why i'm here that's why i'm on this channel and i just i don't know i should not have talked about this one first because i've gone on for so long about this but it's just like damn when i recommend a book to you it's because i can't give you anything more of myself all the books you've ever read create this one huge bridge that tries to stretch and stretch and stretch itself um, across that void. Every new book I read comes to be a part of that overall and unitary book that is the sum of my reading. To compose that general book, each individual book must be transformed, enter into a relationship with the books I have read previously, become their corollary or development or confutation or gloss or reference text. For years, I have been coming to this library, and I explore it volume by volume, shelf by shelf, but I could demonstrate to you that I have done nothing but continue the reading of a single book. <sighs> I don't know how I'm supposed to move on from that, but let's continue wrapping up the, the single book that I've been spending my life reading. So the next chapter in that single unifying book that I got to listen to this month was Sweet Bean Paste. This is um, a quiet little book. It's very, very sweet, potentially too sweet for me, but just to give you a general outline of the story, we follow this man, middle-aged, young, younger, who has been released from prison. We don't know what he was in for. To pay off some of his debts to, I think, a former boss, he is currently working at a doriaki shop. Doriaki are kind of like pancakes filled with sweet bean paste. Um, so he works here, he makes the sweet bean paste. He's kind of frustrated. He's wanted to be a writer for a long time. He's just kind of like scratching every day off of the calendar. This changes when he meets Tokwe, who is this elderly woman. She's in her mid seventies, wants to work at the doriaki shop. She just wants to work there. He doesn't treat her very well because she's an old woman um, and she has really gnarled hands. It's obvious that she's been through something medically in the past and he doesn't treat her very nicely. However, she's very determined and when he tastes like her sweet bean paste, he's like, oh girl, you are a master. You have to come work at the shop. We're gonna boost these sales. It's primarily about their relationship and a couple other people who enter into the text. Um, it's of course about found family. It's about how people who are labeled as different aren't given as much value in society because they can't contribute to the labor force. Karl Marx has entered the scene. We have the incarcerated criminal, he's looked down upon. We have the elderly woman, she's looked down upon. And we also have a high school student who is also looked down upon. I only gave Sweet Bean Paste three stars. I saw a review call it saccharine, which means extremely sweet uh, or sentimental, maybe a little bit too sweet. Um, excessively so and for me that was what I felt here a lot of this felt just very like mushy gushy convenient I loved what we were examining with this um, looking down on people because they can't contribute to working in the capitalist society but I also didn't really like how everything felt very convenient a lot of things felt catered to our protagonist and like his journey in a way that didn't feel 100 percent true i felt the same way about before the coffee gets cold i just felt like it was trying way too hard to the point where it didn't really feel natural a lot of it just felt sentimental for sentimentality's sake i did really like how their connection Takwe and our narrator, like it subverts this fast-paced world of um, consumption, in this case, 
literal consumption because they work at a food shop um, and they find a lot of deeper meaning and connection through food so literally through consumerism like what you are consuming imbibing to uh, make up who you are as a person the story for me did feel a little bit dry i found myself getting quite bored at parts and just wishing it would wrap up i would recommend if you just want a sweet very sweet quiet little book i think the majority of people love this book so i just felt like it wasn't really for me, um, it was just a little bit too sedate, I think. Then I listened to an audiobook and this was my bad. Okay, I messed up here. <laughs> I really messed up here. I listened to Senlin Ascends by Josiah Bancroft. <laughs> I heard about this one on booktube and I was like, oh, this sounds cool. This is about the Tower of Babel. Not the biblical one, this is a fantasy, but the Tower of Babel is obviously this huge structure. It is the tallest in the world and it is just like unimaginably large and full of so many different things and we follow Senlin who is this very like very bookish very cowardly very like I am book educated only I have no experience in the real world I'm shy I'm introverted I am kind of useless unless I can be an academic but he wants to go on his honeymoon with his new wife uh, Maria to the Tower of Babel because he spent his life reading about it and the text that he's read about it sounds so cool so interesting so mind-opening it's like this place of diversity and freedom and collaboration <laughs> it's just a cool fun time to explore different interests and make friends and just be very worldly Semlin obviously falls into the trap of I guess really the American dream. <laughs> There's a lot of similarities between what he thinks of the tower versus what actually ends up happening when he gets there. So he gets there with his wife. He is there for, I think, not even a full day and his wife goes missing. He loses his wife in the crowds of the markets just uh, before the entrance to the tower and she's lost, she's gone. He very quickly starts to learn that the tower is not no, no, no. She's not an equitable place. Uh, she is a place of criminals, of very rich people trying to scam everyone so they can get ahead, of people who are just going to cheat you, lie to you, potentially do you great personal harm. And so Senlin goes into the tower and starts to ascend the levels, searching for his wife. Each floor is going to be like this fantastical world of different fantasy elements, and it's going to be really cool. It's going to be like I don't know, witches and wizards and dragons and who knows what. I went into this thinking it was high fantasy and I didn't realize until literally three quarters of the way through that it is 10,000% steampunk. My bad. That is completely my bad. I didn't see it labeled as steampunk anywhere. I didn't really, like because I wasn't thinking it was at all steampunk when I started to read it, I was just like, oh, this is a cool new fantasy world. Maybe a little bit high fantasy, no. Senlin Ascends is 10,000% steampunk. And I don't really get along with steampunk in terms of literature that well. Trying to read a very clearly steampunk novel as just like your standard average fantasy is extremely confusing and very hard to kind of make work in your head. So I was just kind of fighting myself the whole way reading this book, trying to picture what was going on. I should have clued in when all they really began to talk about was electricity and steam. I have just never felt this much of like an irritated reaction to a very bookish character, which is what I think a lot of these kind of characters should elicit because they pride themselves on being so knowledgeable on reading so many books. He's a headmaster, Senlin is, and in reality like he's incredibly naive. He's so incredibly naive. He has no real world experience. He doesn't truly know what it's like. He is lost in the sauce of the word that he thinks covers that void, but guess what, Sanlin? It doesn't. And you have no real idea what real, true, lived experience looks like because you've been relying on an approximate. Anyway, but he really pissed me off. It was really difficult following him. What was gratifying was following his journey, like him kind of waking up out of this. As for the plot itself and for the world, I think a lot of it felt a little bit haphazard 
quite random at times. The tower is supposed to be this very like stitched together Frankenstein's monster composed of these ringdoms which go around this massive tower and which are different like kingdoms within the tower itself. So I guess the plot kind of matched the, the structure. I wasn't really a fan of too much of the pacing and a lot of it was just really confusing partly because I was trying to imagine something else but I think the scope of the tower <laughs> and like just how large it actually is like I am trying to imagine whole worlds and like cities inside this structure and my mind is just not doing it because it exceeds my limitations of size and scope and so what I'm picturing in my mind just looks hella stupid. I think the writing was pretty solid but I did begin to lose interest as I like finally figured out that it was steampunk and as the book like started to lean more and more heavily into the steampunk stereotypes which I think is where ultimately the next book is really really truly going. I did give this one three and a half stars. Um, will I continue the series? I don't know. If you've read the series, what do you think? Like is the second book cool? Does it get better? That is Senlin um, Ascends. If you like steampunk, <laughs> this is the one for you. So in February, I did a 24-hour readathon where I got to read Cat Diary by Jinji Ito. This was my first Jinji Ito. I love this. I gave this four stars. This is about the author himself and his fiance uh, and then his wife and then their two cats. It is vaguely horrific but mostly it's just funny especially if you are a cat parent like this is just straight up hilarious and it's also very sweet and I just loved it. I connected to this so much. I adored it. I really love his art style and I'm so excited to read more Jinji Ito because it's just so unsettling in just an uncanny way which is like my favorite so really 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 truly enjoyed this and so much of this of course reminded me of my own two little monsters so highly recommend cat diary like heck and adored this okay that's all i have to say not too too much else to say there also this was a gift from my mom so mom if you're watching thank you and then i read agents of the four seasons by kana akatsuki i didn't like this this was sent to me by yen press thank you so much for sending this my way um unfortunately this just did not click with me at all so agents of the four seasons is about the four kind of personified gods and goddesses of the seasons. Um, it's about how winter, no, it's about how spring <laughs> has been missing from the land for 10 years. No one knows where she's gone, but there has been no spring in the land for 10 years. So a lot of it has just been like stalled in winter. I was excited to read this because I freaking love winter. I love it. I love it so much. I adore it. Um, unfortunately, this just became so jumbled. This is also based off of a manga, so the, the translation into just a novel didn't work here for me, in my humble opinion. I don't think I'll be continuing on with the series, so I gave this two stars, very sadly. In the readathon, I also finished listening to The Inheritance Games by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. This is a fun book. It was pretty fun, honestly. I gave it three stars, but still. A fun book about kind of a knives out situation where this billionaire's fortune gets bequeathed to a seemingly unknown party or to someone that no one would have expected. And this unknown person is this high school girl named Avery who gets dragged on down to Texas because she's got some money. She's got some money now and she's like, well, what the hell? I never knew this billionaire. Like what is really going on here? It's supposed to be about puzzles and intrigue and mysteries. I didn't really find the puzzles that puzzly. I think the writing was solid. I think the Inheritance Games has really solid pacing. Like you can fly through this um, and it has a pretty sizable cast of characters, which I personally really enjoy. I think I will honestly continue with this series, but not right away. If you want something fast paced, if you want something entertaining, if you want something fun, I would highly recommend the Inheritance Games. And I think there's four books out currently in the series. I don't know if there's just four of them, but yeah, I enjoyed this. I had a solid time with it. I can't complain too, too much about it. Coming down to the last two books that I read in February, we have Conspicuous Consumption by Veblen. This is a nonfiction uh, satire from the Victorian period about how the unproductive consumption of goods is honorable. So it's all about how the upper class, like they just want to put out the illusion, not even the illusion because they are doing it, but that the more and more they consume, they're like, look how much I can consume 
and I can consume even more. You know, like I have the ability to consume, which makes me honorable, which makes me look really cool and really rich. And I can do all of this without really thinking too much about it and just being really full of leisure, like very nonchalant, you know, I'm just like nonchalantly rich. Really interesting, but it also really put me to sleep because of his writing. And I'm just gonna get to the last one because I've been building and building to this book, but I finished and I read the one and only Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Oh my god. Five stars. New favorite read. If you read this with Carolyn and I for Game of Tomes, first of all, thank you. Second of all, congratulations. And third of all, I did want to let you know that we now have our own book club for this over on Fable as well, which I know so many of you guys are already on because you're in the World Tour book club. I'm happy to tell you that there is now a separate book club for Game of Tomes where we can gush about all of these and of course about our next read for March and April, which is Middle March by George Eliot. Oh, what a book. What a book, man. This covered the void for me, you know? It really, really covered up the void. I was so immersed so immersed dumas is so talented i think what this book boils down to is that it is just a goddamn story you know like it's a story that you just want to sit and be told you're like a little kid at the fireside begging for more and you just want to know what happens and you just want to keep reading and its scope is so large and the consequences are so huge and it's just such a like formidable thing it's so significant you can't look away you can't turn away this had never been high up on my tbr at all until we put it on game of tomes and thank thank god for that really truly thank god for that because this was incredible this is about this young man named edmund <laughs> oh my god I'm upset that i finished it that i don't want to have to talk about it in my wrap-up because i don't want it to be over dantes the sailor he gets into a little bit of unfortunate trouble um, but he has his whole life ahead of him and it's looking so promising. He's gonna marry the woman of his dreams He just got promoted to captain of the ship that he loves working on He's got a good income things are just going so well for him and yet some people three people Are very jealous of him and they have it out for him I think the Count of Monte Cristo is now one of my favorite literary characters of all time I love a good revenge story. The Count of Monte Cristo is a revenge story at its heart. It's just started raining. This is perfect. The craft displayed in here, like the dedication that Dumas takes with every single character, with every single scene. The pacing, by the way, in this mammoth of a book, also superb. If you are scared of starting a book from this time period, a book that is labeled as a classic, and especially a book that is as large as this boy i don't just want to sit here and be like well don't be scared but i can really truly tell you that you have no cause to be scared or to be intimidated by the count because this book will hold you and guide you and you don't even have to read like this book reads itself i was so surprised sitting down how i didn't want to get up how i wasn't flicking to the end to see where the chapter ended like i don't think i did that once this was just so immersive so juicy and so entertaining so entertaining um and so satisfying such a satisfying read i'm not going to get into any of the nitty-gritty portions of the novel here because carolyn and i will be having a whole video dedicated to this book which will be coming out soon i think after this video and it's just one of those books really truly one of those books that you're like yes reading is the best freaking thing in the world that's my other five star read from this month i love this to death i just want to say thank you so much for reading this with us and um i've seen literally mostly just five star reviews from you guys of this book so also that is another stamp of approval to let you know that it's probably your time to read the count of monte cristo okay so i'm gonna sign off now my throat is dying because i spoke for so long hope you got some good recommendations i hope if you pick up any of these books that you really enjoy them the links if you want to check them out they're completely free to join for both book clubs are down below in the description box as always and ever please let me know what your favorite read of the month was thank you guys so much love you ciao